13. Uh, you'll find that on page 276. Page 276, 1 Samuel chapter 13. And we're going to read at verse 5. The Philistines assembled to fight the Israelites. They had 30,000 war chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and as many soldiers as there are grains on the sand of the seashore. They went to Michmash east of Beth-Avon and camped there. And then they launched a strong attack against the Israelites, putting them in a desperate situation. Some of the Israelites hid in caves and holes, or among the rocks or in the pits and wells. Others crossed the river Jordan into the territories of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and the people with him were trembling with fear. He waited seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him to do. But Samuel still had not come to Gilgal. The people began to desert Saul. So he said to them, bring me the burnt sacrifices and the fellowship sacrifices. He offered a burnt sacrifice And just as he was finishing, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet him and welcome him. But Samuel said, what have you done? Saul answered, the people were deserting me. You hadn't come when you said you would. Besides that, the Philistines are gathering at Michmash. So I thought... The Philistines are going to attack me here at Gilgal, and I've not tried to win the Lord's favor. So I felt I had to offer a sacrifice. That was a foolish thing to do, Samuel answered. You have not obeyed the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had obeyed, He would have let you and your descendants rule over Israel forever. But now your rule will not continue. Because you have disobeyed him, the Lord will find the kind of man he wants and make him ruler of his people. Before we begin to uh, reflect on uh, those verses, there are two very, very short videos that I want to show you. They'll be quite different, but I think they will make the point. If we can get the first one to come up. Things come to those who wait. Best things come to those who wait. Was good things come to those who wait? That was the advert in 1987. Fifteen years later, things are different. tomato ketchup in the new upside-down bottle. 
No wait. No mess. No anticipation. See how the adverts have changed over 15 years? First advert with the music and the song, anticipation. You're willing to wait. Even if you have to shake the bottle, make sure you haven't taken the cap off first, then take it off, tip it upside down, and you wait. And you keep waiting. Because it takes a long time to get out of the glass bottle. But the wait is worthwhile. But 15 years later, things are different. Life has moved on, society has changed, and now we have these plastic squeezy bottles, so there's no weight, and there's no mess. I'm not sure about that, but there's no anticipation. And yet the Bible talks to us about waiting in eager expectation. And yet, patience seems to be in short supply. I'm sure you've heard the poem that begins, Patience is a virtue. Get it if you can. Seldom in a woman, never in a man. And yet, one vital ingredient in godly character is the fruit of patience. Patience is, after all, the character of God. How patient and long-suffering God is with us. And patience is there within those verses of Galatians that describe the fruit of the Spirit. But our world doesn't really help us to develop patience. We have microwaves now, so we don't have to put the baked potato in the oven and, and wait for an hour just three or four minutes, and it's there. Our stress levels begin to go up, don't they? The moment we drive round the corner and the green light turns red. Or we've gone into the shop and we're queuing up and somebody's forgotten something and they go back to search for it in the shop. There are so many moments in everyday life when patience is something that we need so desperately. My wife sat there shaking her head thinking, my husband is the worst person in the world to be talking on the subject of patience. But this morning we're going to compare and contrast. We're not doing an English essay, but we're going to look at Saul, whose impatience cost him the kingdom. And we'll look at Joseph, who through learning patience, well, he didn't quite win the kingdom, but he came close. We'll begin with Saul, something of whose story we have read there. Saul was impatient, and the result was he lost the kingdom. What a privilege had been his, to be chosen by God, to be the king of his people, to lead them, to guide them, to represent God to them and them to God. What a privilege this man had. And yet he loses it all because of his impatience. He becomes impatient, like many of us do, when things start to get a little tricky and we start to get a little bit panicky. Did you pick it up as we were reading? The Philistines were on their way. And so were Saul's soldiers in the other direction. And as for Samuel, the prophet, the man of God, who said he would come, didn't look like he was on the way to anywhere. Certainly not when Saul needed him. And so Saul is getting nervous. He's getting worried. He's getting very panicky. And yet the thing about patience is that it's in the trouble. It's in the moments that we are tempted to worry. It's in those moments when things are out of our control that there is the opportunity for the fruit of patience to ripen within our lives. See, if everything goes along exactly as we had planned, to schedule, and with a minimum of effort as well, when are we ever going to need any patience? 
And life isn't like that anyway, is it? Of course, it's very easy to say we need to develop patience. Much harder where we're in the thick of things. Much harder when we are, are living with pain and it won't go away. How do we have patience to endure that? And how do we have patience with people who, who want to help, but actually we would rather just not have the bother of having conversation right now? We need patience within our homes, with our husband, our wife, our children, our parents, with that really stupid thing that they do that really winds us up. We need patience. When we're praying for our children, struggling to uh, understand faith and, 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 and to trust in God, or when we're praying for them to come back again to the Lord. We offer our prayers and nothing seems to change. So many moments every day for the opportunity for the fruit of patience to reveal itself but not so with Saul. As we read in, in 1 Samuel 13, Saul simply takes things into his own hands. And we read, didn't we? Samuel had given him clear instructions. You wait for seven days, and I'll be there. Verse 13 also tells us that Samuel had given him a word from the Lord. He had given him some word of encouragement and instruction from the Lord. But Saul somehow has to just take things into his own hands. Things were getting hard. Things were getting complicated here. And so Saul decides that he really ought to do something. And after all, God helps those who help themselves, right? Wrong. Where do we find that in the scripture? We don't. I'm not suggesting we just sit around and do nothing and just wait for God to just sort it all out. But if God helps those who help themselves, would we want to think that God helps Cain to kill his brother Abel? Why didn't God help Moses when Moses killed one of the Egyptian slave drivers? and say, Moses, well done, you've got the process on the go, now I'm going to come in and help you a little more. It doesn't happen. God helps those who listen and who obey and who learn to wait patiently for him. God doesn't need us to take things into our hands and try and force his. But that's what Saul did. He made the sacrifices instead of waiting for Samuel to arrive. And he had a good excuse too. I needed to seek the Lord's favor. Notice how spiritual that sounds. How could Samuel fail to be impressed with the godly character of this man? Samuel is not impressed at all. That was a really stupid thing that you did. Why? Not because we just sit back and, and, and wait and, and, and never do anything, but because God had given his word. And God had given certain directions. And God has given directions for us too in the kind of people he wants us to be and the kind of way that he wants us to live our lives. And that doesn't always look as if it's going to bear great fruit but we're called to trust God in all of the circumstances of our lives and to keep living the way that he has called us to. But impatience really is the fruit of a lack of trust. Saul panics instead of waiting patiently for the Lord. We read that he had a word from the Lord. He had a promise from Samuel, the man of God. Well, that wasn't enough. Why does Saul act in the way that he does? It's because he is impatient. 
Why is he impatient? Because he's beginning to panic. Things are not working out. Why does he panic? Because he is not trusting the Lord. I love the story of a well-known preacher. You may or may not have heard of Phillips Brooks. He was actually well-known for a very calm, quiet manner. And then one day, a friend of his found him pacing up and down like a caged lion and said to him, Dr. Brooks, what's the matter? And Dr. Brooks says, what's the matter? The matter is I'm in a hurry. But God isn't. And patience is learning to trust God's timing. Even when that's hard. Because as we will see, as we think about Joseph in a moment, in the end, God will demonstrate that his timing is always good and right. But before we do, are we tempted to take things into our own hands like so? You know, are we tempted to turn to a medium or to our horoscope because we can't wait for the true and living God to speak into our lives? Do we work all weekend as well as all week because somehow we don't think that God will provide? Or do we lash out with some rather choice words to our neighbour because... We're in too much of a hurry to allow God to take vengeance, although I hardly think vengeance is what's needed when the neighbours park just six inches across our drive. But impatience in the everyday little things can have as much disastrous consequences as Saul's big action. You know, we go to the doctor's surgery We have to wait 45 minutes. I mean, four and a half is too long. But what if it's because somebody has a serious health issue? The doctor's giving them the time that they need. Actually, wouldn't we want that if it was us? Or one of our family or friends? Or we've got into the wrong till at the shop. And what annoys us is really that we're so practiced at this. There's two queues. One's got six people and one got four. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we join the queue with four. Because we've already cleverly not only counted the people, we look at the baskets. And our mind does a really quick calculation about how many bits are in how many baskets. And how many people have got to be served. And so we know which is the right queue. Only it's not. And we're standing there thinking, Dor, how could I have got it so wrong? And look at all the 36 and a half seconds it's going to cost me. And then when the last person just can't find the credit card in their bag, wow, that's when steam really comes out of our ears. And we can multiply these examples of everyday life in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, when we're in the shop, when we're traveling. And sometimes it's actually just some simple little things we need to do. You know, if we leave for work 10 minutes earlier than we actually really need to, if the lights turn red, then we're not going to be late anyway, are we? You know, if we took some stuff from the table and took it out to the kitchen and made two journeys rather than trying to stumble out with everything in one go and dropping half of it, it actually would work out better in the end. And so sometimes we need just simply to leave ourselves a little more time. Sometimes we need to be a little bit more realistic about what we can achieve. And probably most of us get a little bit more impatient when we're with others because we want to show off that we can carry everything out to the kitchen in one go. Actually, we could have just asked them, could you take something as well? And it's important because those things bring uh, an atmosphere into our home. They spoil times that we could enjoy with our friends. 
or they mess up our witness at work and with our neighbours. And it's not in all of those in all of those everyday things, it's not that we need huge faith in God about some special promise. Because where did God ever promise to make the traffic lights always green for us? Where did God ever promise that my child would be the model child? What we need is moment by moment through the day, a little bit of common sense. Reliance upon God for his grace and strength and the development of that fruit of patience. The like of which Saul never had, but the like of which Joseph learned over time. See, Joseph learned patience and eventually he gained the rewards. Joseph is the young man who had a dream, literally. And yet for years it just didn't seem as if it was ever going to happen. You know the story. He's his father's favourite son, and so his brother's public enemy number one. And then he has this dream, which uh, he, he, he explains to them, brothers, listen to me. We were out in the field, we were cutting corn, and then you know what? My sheaf of corn stood up really big and tall, and all of yours bowed down to it. His brothers didn't need an interpreter of dreams to tell them what their younger brother was really saying. And yet somehow they were from God. And eventually God did make it happen when God was ready. And when God had made Joseph ready. But I think there was a long process of learning patience through the struggles that he experienced. If you sit down and read the story in one go, you'll see that on, on several occasions there were just little glimmers of hope. Maybe things aren't going to be so bad. Maybe we're just about to turn a corner here. One day he goes out to visit his brothers. His father sends him to find out news, how they're doing. They see him coming and decide they're going to take him and, and they stick him down a pit. And Joseph must have been stood there thinking, well, I really don't know how we're going to get out of here. Only then, for some unknown reason, or at least unknown to Joseph, his brothers decide to let down a rope and and, and, and get it round him and and pull him back out again. Have they changed their mind? Mm, No. They've actually seen some traders on their way to Egypt, so they're going to sell him and make some money. So that little glimmer of hope's gone. And perhaps with it, the dream. But then he arrives in Egypt and he is sold to Potiphar. Only Potiphar turns out to be not that bad. As a boss, he's quite reasonable. He's he's quite kind. And he trusts Joseph because he discovers that Joseph is honest and Joseph works hard. Is there a little glimmer of hope here? That maybe things are possibly going to work out after all? Well, if there was, it's soon snuffed out because Potiphar's wife makes advances to him. Joseph refuses her. She accuses him of sexual harassment. Potiphar gets angry and Joseph ends up in prison. And I guess as he slumped down that night, he must have wondered, well, where's the dream now? And then in prison, he found favour with the guards. And after some time, two other men come and join him in the prison, who are special servants of Potiphar. Uh, sorry, not Potiphar, Pharaoh. One is butler and one is baker. And after a little while, see, patience can only be learned over time. Anyway, after a bit of time, these two guys have a, a, a dream. And it's bad news for the baker, he's going to be hung. But it's good news for the butler. He's going to be freed, he's going to have his job back, and he's going to enjoy his life again. And as he gets up to leave prison, Joseph says, before you go, just put in a good word for me. Just maybe things could change here. He's got a friend now, a friend whom he's helped, who owes him one. And he can put a word in with Pharaoh, the the top man. Only the butler goes and forgets all about Joseph. 
Every time things seem that they might get better, his hopes are dashed. What of you this morning? Is there a dream, a hope, a longing that just seems it's never going to happen? The dream of one day getting married? The hope of having your own family? The longing for promotion out of a dead-end job? Enough so that you can own your own home? Or is there another kind of dream Because the Lord's put something in your heart. It's like he's promised you something. Only there's just no sign of it happening. You're tempted to do a Saul and take things into your own hands? Or can we learn from Joseph and see the value of patience? See, eventually, Pharaoh has another dream. And oops, now the butler suddenly remembers Joseph. And Joseph interprets the dreams. Joseph is put into the place of real responsibility. Because God has prepared him for it. God knows that that responsibility will not go to his head. He won't misuse the power that he's given. And we see how eventually patience brings its reward. But I wonder, when did Joseph begin to know that? See, Genesis 39, three times says, the Lord is with Joseph. I wonder whether Joseph always thought that. When did Joseph begin to realise that? When did Joseph begin to become convinced that God was in control? We don't have time this morning to think a little practically of how patience can be grown. We'll pick that up uh, next week when we look at both the stories of uh, two other people, Abraham and Job, and reflect further upon how we can develop patience. But may the Lord help us to learn from Saul and Joseph. May the Lord give us the grace so that we don't make the mistakes of a Saul. And may the Lord give us grace by his spirit so that like Joseph, we learn the value of patience. Let's pray together.